Welcome to my talk, News from Actinia. I will present the news that happened in the last two years within Actinia because uh, last year, unfortunately, the Phosphor-G couldn't take place. My name is Carmen and I work for Mundialis, which is located in Bonn. It was founded in 2015 and focuses on the processing of large EO data. Um, yeah, and I started there already in 2015, so I took part in the history quite a long time already. What we will see in this talk is the previously on Actinia talk. I um, just a quick summary of it, which I did in the Phosphor G 2019 in Bucharest. For those of you who don't know Actinia yet, because it just became an OSU community project in 2019. I will show you some new features and also features in related repositories. And then I will give a short overview of Actinia and different projects. But first, the greatest news, we managed to release Actinia 100 just in May this year. And it was possible because we did an Actinia code sprint um, for some days and uh, did quite a lot of work there. Um, mostly basic work and not many new features, but more structural work. So let's see what Actinia is and what the core concepts are. For this to understand, we need to understand the core concepts of GRAS-GIS. I won't explain what it is because I guess you know, but uh, two concepts are very fundamental. One is the GRAS database, which is uh, um, storage for geodata. And within it, there are different locations. Each location has a different EPSG code. So the GRAS database is a little bit divided by it. Within each location, um, we can have different map sets, which can um, we say are the projects which we use. And within these map sets are the real geodata, like raster data, vector data, and space-time data sets. Another fundamental concept are the CrossGIS modules, which are quite a lot. Um, the first letter always indicates the family of it, like vector data, raster data, and imagery data modules for processing and there are more than 500 modules so really a lot and this is only in the CRAS-GIS core and there are also many add-ons available. So what would need to be done in Actinia for it to make CRAS-GIS available as a REST API? One thing is that we need to manage the locations and map sets and geodata as resources Another thing is to enable the use of the CRAS-GIS modules and we need a user management to um, map different maps to different users so everyone can have its own maps but also shared maps and also limitations and pixels because processing can become quite heavy. And uh, this was done by having a two CRAS databases actually. One is permanent and uh, global and read-only. And each of the Actinia CRAS GIS uh, containers you see to the right in the middle uh, mount this database and have access to it. And then there's the second one, the user database, which uh, depends on the user. So whenever a user calls a process, then this certain user database is mounted so that it doesn't get in conflict with all the other users. And because it's mounted, each container can access the data, but it um, uses the same data pool. And for the containers to communicate, we use a Redis database. And for example, if in one Actinia container, a process is running and the user wants to know the current status, then it will send a request to Actinia and wouldn't know in which container it will get the response from. And um, just any container can then look up the status of the process in the Redis database. And this whole thing is packed into Docker and it can be deployed in multiple cloud environments. We have experience with Docker Swarm and OpenShift and Kubernetes and Actinia is running there successfully. And we also, um, use Terraform to start a VM and have Actinia running there. How does it look like in practice? We can get the locations and as a response, we get a JSON file 
with all the locations listed. The same goes for map sets. So we have a list of all map sets which are available. And then we have raster layers and render endpoints even. So we can, for example, request which um, raster layers are contained in a certain map set. And we can even render maps as a result, which is quite handy for processing if we just want to have a quick preview what, what was processed. So the last two slides um, took uh, a little bit contact to the first concept of CrustGIS. And this slide um, manages to include the CrustGIS modules and the Actinia concept. There are two kinds of processing, ephemeral and persistent processing. And with the ephemeral processing, it is needed to specify an output format, for example, GeoTIFF or raster data. And then the results can be downloaded after processing. The other way is the persistent processing and there um, a map set needs to be specified and the result will not be exported from CrustUS, but still stays in the CRUST database and can then be used for further processing. Okay, now let's see what features uh, happened in the last two years. First, we take a look at um, two cool features which provide one functionality combined. It's the storage of interim results and the job resumption. And the storage of interim results uh, enables the storage after each process step. A process chain for Actinia is built up of different steps, which are most likely different CrustGIS modules. And after each successful step, the map set is saved so it can be used later. And the second feature for it to make really sense is a job resumption. Um, for example, when a job fails, then it can be started again and the calculation will resume where it left off before. And this is especially very handy when we have a large jobs which run for multiple days and after maybe three days, some error happens and um, then we don't need to restart it again, but can just use what we calculated before and continue. This feature also allows the, um, to see the different logs for each um, iteration which runs. So, for example, if it um, runs into an error after three days again, then the two results can be compared and then we can see if it maybe is really a bug and we need to fix it somehow. Another huge feature, actually two, um, are related to the space-time raster data sets. And, um, even though they are really different, they are actually the same. Just one is for ephemeral processing and the other one is for persistent processing. For ephemeral processing, we can now export space-time RASA data sets that was not possible before. And we can use this by setting the type to SDRDS, which means space-time RASA data set. And then we get uh, multiple GeoTIFFs as download. And the second feature is for persistent processing and this was not included before because on processing, Actina runs in a temporary class database, which then needs to be merged back once the job is finished. And because the structure of a space-time raster data set is a little bit more complicated than for vector raster data, it was not implemented before because the reference to the raster data contains the map set name. And with this feature, it is um, possible now. It still has some limitations because of a CrustGIS concept that um, it's not allowed to have a space and raster data set with raster data from different map sets, or you need to be in the map set to calculate it. But we're still working on this. Another cool feature is the monitoring of map set sizes. There are different endpoints available, and <clears throat> during calculation, it is now possible to see the size in bytes of uh, the map set because it become, can become quite large during processing. And there are also endpoints available to render these, um, these sizes and to run differences on them and to only get the maximum size as a result, which is also very useful if we have like a test process and need to estimate the storage which the, which needs to be mounted uh, for Actinia so it can run successfully. 
Then we have a little feature, which is also very handy. It's the version output and um, it's enhanced here. Before you could only see the version of Actinia and the installed plugins. And now you can see the versions of the plugins as well, the Python version. And for us, the most useful, the CrustGIS version. And you can only, not only see the version of CrustGIS, but also the revision, which means it's the commit hash. So we really know in each installed Actinia um, which CrustGIS is used there. Then another cool feature, um, it was actually one of the reasons why we um, released the 100 version because it's a breaking change and it enables the upload of a local GeoTIFF. And it was a breaking change because before the endpoint existed already, but it was used to create a new raster layer by um, Air Mapset. And now it's possible to upload local data, which was more useful for us. So we changed this endpoint. And then um, I just gave a, a quick overview what all cool features we implemented. And these are more little features, enhancements, uh, documentation improvements, linting improvements. Um, but one which I want to highlight is the Helm chart. We developed a Helm chart. On, it's on GitHub available and it can be used for Kubernetes and most likely also for OpenShift, but we didn't test it for OpenShift yet. And then we also have sad news. Uh, we reached the end of life of Artinia GDI, um, the one that is available on GitHub. We're still using it in some projects, but project specific uh, adjustments. But the GitHub Actinia GDI now became the Actinia module plugin and the Actinia metadata plugin. Okay, so now we have an overview of what happened in Actinia Core. And uh, now I will give an overview, a short summary, of what happened in some related repositories. One is uh, the OpenEO API, and we developed the OpenEO Kraskis driver, which is the um, translator, so to say, for Actinia into the OpenEO API interface. And here you can see the OpenEO web editor, and uh, it loads collections and processes. And what we did is to enable the usage of Kraskis modules because uh, OpenAI, OpenAO already specifies uh, a number of processes which are predefined. Um, so it can be used in every backend, but uh, we also wanted to use the whole functionality of CrustJS. So we um, specified um, additional processes and we use uh, the interface description of CrustJS for this. And you can see the input and output and types of it, and uh, so the CrustJS modules can be used. How we achieved this was to um, develop the self-description in the Actinia module plugin, which was before Actinia GDI. And this allows us to get all CrustJS and Actinia modules via an HTTP endpoint. And because I said already there are more than 500, there are filters available to not be overwhelmed by all the modules, but to pick which fits. And um, to the right, you see a JSON file of an output of one certain um, cross module or process. And this is uh, conformed to the OpenEO API with one exception. Uh, at the bottom, we have an array of resources and with OpenEO, it's only one um, output allowed. But because the GrassGIS modules have multiple outputs, we decided to break it here. And uh, the OpenEO Kraskus driver will then create multiple pseudo modules for each output. Um, we also added a template management in the Actinia module plugin. To the left, you can see a normal process chain, which can be sent to Actinia to do the processing. And here it consists of two modules, G-Regent and Earthwork Aspect. And this process chain can only be used for the elevation map in a certain map set. And um, to make it reusable, we implemented the concept of process chain templates. And to the right, you can see the same process chain, but uh, there's elevation map as a, a template variable. And out, outside of it, there's an ID and description of the template itself. 
This template can be stored in Actinia. Um, with the HTTP POST request, we implemented a whole create, read, update, and delete management of these process chain templates. And with POST, they can be created. With GET, they can be retrieved again. <coughs> and they can be updated and deleted as well. But one more cool feature is that they are not also readable with the HTTP GET endpoint for the templates, but now they also appear in the modules endpoint, which I explained before. And I said the module endpoints returns CrustGIS modules and Actinia modules, and you might have wondered what Actinia modules are, and now you know they're basically just process chain templates. And in the modules, uh, it looks like this, as you see in the JSON below. And for the parameters, you only have the placeholder elevation map, which was defined in the process template before. And the description is passed for the first appearance in the template with the CrustJS interface description. Okay, and uh, the best thing is that we can really use it for processing. Before, First, we saw the process chain JSON, which was quite long. And now we have this JSON, which calls our Actinia module and only needs to set the elevation map as parameter. It might not appear huge, but you can imagine for projects uh, where we do a lot of processing, the process chains can get quite large. I use this one because it still fits on the, cre on the screen, but we have process chains which are really, really huge and this is very helpful, so it's um, really visible what needs to be changed. Yeah, and then um, at the bottom, I just show that um, this JSON can be posted to a processing endpoint, and then it can be retrieved as a map, and we can see it with the ephemeral processing. Okay, now you get an overview of the new features in Actinia, and also the features of related repositories. And we still have one topic which I want to show you, which is the usage of Actinia in projects. I picked three projects because they are really different. Um, the first one is FTTH, which, mean, which means Fiber to the Home by Deutsche Telekom. And we develop customized processes. One example is the calculation of potential trenches to see where the tension, where the trenches of the fiber might be digged. And in this example, um, there are multiple components involved. FME is started, then it will inform Steep. Steep will start a VM and inform Actina GDI. The Actina GDI is still alive in this project because it has uh, multiple tasks um, also to add um, the status of the process into the database. And Actina GDI will then reach Actinia Core, which was started by Steep on a VM to do the real processing. Another example is Loose. It's a technology project and um, the components showed there are, as well as with the other two projects you see here, just a small pick of uh, the things which are maybe the most related to Actinia. Of course, there are much more components involved in this project. Uh, with Loose, we also do processing, of course, with CrustGIS and Actinia. And here we have also a stack catalog of data. And <clears throat> um, the processes are started in multiple ways. One example is to start it via the OpenAI web editor, which you already saw before, which then starts a job with the OpenAI CrustGIS driver, which translated into a process chain for Actinia, which then does the processing. And one last example is Hermosa. Um, it's a project together with Terrestris and it's uh, different as well because we have a web client uh, by, with React uh, Geo, which is a combination of React.js and Open Layers and Shogun. And um, the job is started by the web client, by the user, with a dedicated interface for certain processes. And then the job is running in Actinia, and when the job is finished, a layer in Geo server is published, which is then back shown into the React Geo web client. Okay, and last but not least, the Outlook. We have coming up on Saturday an OS Geo code sprint where we take part with Actinia. If you're interested, please join us. 
And the things we want to tackle in the future is the stack integration and uh, also to use the Actinia, user, uh, Actinia authentication and remove it from the core to make it available via other software, for example, Keyclock. And um, to the right, you can see other related projects um, and they are linked. You can see them all on GitHub. And that's it for now. Thank you very much. And do you have any questions? All right, so thank you, Carmen, for the presentation. I think you're muted. Yes, you're welcome. <laughs> So thanks, and uh, we have uh, basically one question from from the chat uh, from somebody who is new to Actinia. Uh, do you implement the OGC APIs, or is the REST API unique to Actinia? Um, yes, we thought about it, and it's still somewhere in the background. But we focused on the OpenEO API first because it's yeah kind of a standard as well. Actinia itself, it's unique, yes, it's not a standard, but um, currently OpenAO open makes sense for us, so we developed OpenAO Kraskis driver for the translation. Okay, thank you. Uh, we are getting more questions. This is the next one. Uh, have you played around with Kubernetes jobs, cron jobs to run Actinia jobs? Mm, not yet. But um, yeah, we're thinking of developing something to distribute the jobs a bit smarter as it is done currently. So this would be a way to go, definitely, yes. Okay, thanks. One question from me. Uh, how, how do you plan to support stack? Is this going to be like an output or are you using it as an input or are you going to support the API of stack? What, what is the plan for the code sprint? Um, two approaches. One is that we want to include existing stack catalogs and kind of harvesting them. So they are referenced and Actinia can be queried and they are returned. And then on the other hand, they can be used for processing. So Actinia will um, get the data, retrieve the data, and put it in a way that CrossJS can um, calculate it, and then it's passed to CrossJS for the calculations. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we don't have any more questions from, from the chat. So I would like to thank you again for joining. And, thank you uh, for, for organizing and managing. <laughs> Thanks. So we are going to be back in about five minutes with uh, the next presentation. So stay tuned. <laughs>